as I sit here nursing a hamstring injury, we thought this would be a great time to do a paper review on some of the interventional work you could probably do to fix your hamstring. So hamstring injuries are one of the most common injuries in sports, strains, ruptures, tendonitis, any form of hamstring injury, any field sport, any running sports, they all have massive amounts of hamstring injuries. And we want to take a look at some ways you could rehab this, but also more importantly, prevent it from ever happening and ever letting it become an issue. So check out today's paper review on Nordic hamstring extensions. So today's paper is coming to us from Brazil. The title is four weeks of Nordic hamstring exercise reduced muscle injury risk factors in young adults. So what we had was a randomized control trial. So we had a four week interventional program. We had 20 participants uh, between the ages of 18 and 35. All participants had no previous hamstring injury and no lower leg in injury within the last 12 months. The participants also had done no lower limb training within the last six months, which is great for the study because it gives us kind of a homogenous place to start, but tells us a lot about those 20 participants who've all been clearly skipping leg day. And I say that not as a meme, but as a poor reflection on those subjects, but it's great for the study. So basically what we had was a four week interventionist program. They basically wanted to see the effects of Nordic hamstring exercise on the effects of hamstring strength hamstring to quad strength ratio, posterior chain flexibility, and bicep femoris long head fascicle length. So what they had was a four week intervention study. They gave them a program to do for four weeks. They took measures five days before they started the program and five days after the program started. So what they measured was they did an ultrasonograph of their bicep femoris long head. So that was checked for the fascicle length. They did a flexibility test. So they did a dynamic warm up, and then they did a sit and reach for the hamstring length. So fairly basic test. And then finally, they had isokinetic strength measurements taken. So they had their isometric strength concentric strength and eccentric strength uh, maximal test and peak torque values are then taken from this. So over to Fitzy, pretty simple interventionalist, but uh, a quality study to see some, hopefully see some meaningful results. Right, so on to the results. As Garf said, this is a kind of very interesting results section, although the study is very simple. The metrics they're looking at here gives us a lot of insight into what this kind of training can achieve. So we're going to look at first is areas where the training group, so the group that did the intervention, improved significantly more than the control group. This happened in isometric peak torque, eccentric peak torque, eccentric work, and hamstring to quad functional ratio. Areas where we didn't see significant differences in the changes were concentric peak torque, concentric work, and then the conventional hamstring to quad ratio. In total, the training group had a small effect size when we look at concentric torque, isometric torque, concentric work, and that conventional hamstring to quad ratio again. Then there was shown to be a moderate effect size, well, larger effect size again, for eccentric peak torque, eccentric work, and the functional relationship between hamstring and quad. Then the muscle thickness, so uh, in this paper is called BFLH, that's bicep femoris long head. It's one of the three hamstrings that's in the back of each leg. Uh, the muscular thickness didn't change across the intervention for either group, which is kind of to be expected. But one thing in terms of muscle architecture that did change, so we didn't have an increase in size, but we did have a decrease in pination angle in the, in the work group, so the group that did the hamstring curls, and we also had an increase in fascial length in that group. So to kind of sum up that section, we had a trivial effect size for uh, if there was any change in the actual thickness of the muscle. We had then a large effect size for pination angle, and we had a very large effect size for change in fascial length. The last part of the result section then is that there was no change in mobility uh, between training group uh, or in the control group over the course of the intervention. First of all, what we got here is, is reassuring. Basically, it's that strength training works. So strength training has positive impacts on your muscle physiology. So that's very reassuring. So thank God we know that. So no, but that is very useful to know that they kind of it impacted very positive changes in as little as four weeks. So we saw, even though these were very untrained with lower limbs, they were still somewhat trained. Um, so I would imagine for most people though, if you're probably at a deficit with hamstring strength, this would see some pretty significant impacts, I think within the first few weeks. Uh, interesting enough, if you're looking at these hamstring preemptive work for hamstring tendons. Uh, a lot of times it takes 
the kind of researchers would know that it takes about four weeks for some kind of tendon adaption to occur. So it's interesting that's the same kind of time frame they chose. But kind of long story short, this is very useful for any of our real athletes or any of our kind of, you know, weightlifters or powerlifters looking to kind of massively, not massively increase, but positively impact their hamstring work specifically, like without loading it massively. Okay. So what we had here was, you know, if you look at like athletes who have, you know, it would make sense that this would prevent injury prevention. So if you're looking at like the hamstrings function in running, so it, it decelerates the lower limbs of the body. So the stronger you are in your quadriceps would like impact the level of forces interacting between each other. So the imbalance between these. So if your hamstring, which is one of the ratios they looked at was hamstring and strength, quadriceps strength ratio. So if your quadriceps were particularly strong or your hamstrings were particularly weak, if you're impacting a lot of forces through your quadricep and your hamstring is not able to decelerate so it's acting as an antagonist if it's not able to tolerate this load efficiently because it's not um well conditioned enough or is not able to import enough kind of concentric or eccentric forces it's likely it's going to get injured so if you look at stuff like change direction we're looking at huge forces trying to reverse that direction so this would make perfect sense for anyone looking at kind of injury prehab work in field sports or any particular running sport like that so any any kind of mobility or moving sports this is very very important the second big point about this i think is useful for everyone watching is that this is a preemptive study so i think that's so fucking useful uh, the problem with preemptive stuff is you'll never know if it works if you never end up getting injured but i suppose that's kind of the the risk you have to take but this is a prehab or preemptive i think that's so useful if you look at hamstring injuries on field sports or real athletes or you know it's a huge number of injuries so it accounts for in the study they quoted from 2001 2014 there's a four percent increase annually so since 2001 2014 there's been a four percent increase in hamstrings every year in soccer players so this is in brazil so there's a massive number of soccer players playing so if you look at this hamstring injuries are very common occurrence and anyone watching has probably had some kind of hamstring history throughout their life if you've played any kind of sports so this is so useful that this is a preemptive thing so i would say from practical implications from this study i would definitely go about looking at doing some nordics you know if you once twice a week if you're a weightlifter a powerlifter or real athlete combat sports anyone kicking imagine the force is going through your your hamstring i would say this is low fatigue well, it feels like it's fatiguing a lot at the moment, but it's not a lot of fatigue in terms of your central nervous system or it will cause some muscle damage, but it's not putting a lot of pressure in your joints. It's body weight. It doesn't need a lot of equipment. Maybe you need someone to help you with it, but very, very useful for preemptive work. So I'd say once, twice a week, and it could be very, very useful. Again, often stuff that's prehab work very, works very well for rehab stuff. So if you have hamstring injuries right now or hamstring tendon issues or anything like that, I'd say it's a very useful thing to begin implementing once you can do it without significant levels of pain. So if you once you're kind of clear to return to play, I'd say this is a very useful, not only as a prehab, but as a rehab system. And then after, once your injury is gone, you can use it effectively for prehab. So I'd say get on the Nordics and very, very useful. The discussion then, uh, I have two main points in this to kind of follow on from Gurf. And the first one really piggybacks on, on one of Gurf's points when we talk about the difference between like concentric and eccentric strength in the quadriceps and hamstrings and one of the parts that's brought up in this study and one of the things that's looked at is like the conventional hamstring to quad ratio and the functional hamstring to quad ratio so conventionally when people would have compared hamstring to quads to see imbalances or things like this so if they're ranking players to see who might be more prone to injury you'll see them using or they would have conventionally have used the hamstring to quad ratio where it's concentric peak torque in hamstrings versus concentric peak torque in quads the functional ratio is something that came along after that and that's kind of gives better insight into like how prepared that leg is to accelerate and decelerate without being as prone to injury so what the functional ratio looks at is its eccentric strength in the hamstring and concentric strength in the quadriceps so it's like eccentric peak torque versus concentric peak torque so when we think about sprinting this ratio really makes a lot more sense of why the functional ratio is a lot more applicable than the conventional ratio when we're sprinting we apply force by putting a foot out in front of us we will put that foot on the ground violently extend at the knee and hip so the concentric strength of the quad is very very important obviously at the end of our stride then so as our knee reaches full extension and as we try to stop that knee from extending we obviously need to have eccentric strength in the hamstring this comes about in sprinting it comes about through change in direction drills it comes about through agility and acceleration drills 
So the functional ratio seems to be a much, much better fit for kind of athletic populations. The second thing then to discuss is the pination angle. So certain things didn't change, like we didn't have a huge change in certain peak torques during the intervention. But one thing we did have a noted change in is pination angle or angle of pination. What you can see from this diagram here is pination angle is basically talking about the direction in which the fibers are aligning themselves within the muscle tissue. We want lower angles of pination uh, to have higher contractile forces. Obviously, a lower angle of pination means my muscle fibers are pulling in a better direction, so I'll have to contract less distance to get more force into the tendon and eventually into the bone. Angle of pination is usually measured using some sort of ultrasound machine, obviously, in cadaver samples and stuff you can just peel it back and see it but usually in this test uh, in particular they used an ultrasound machine it's a non-invasive test so it's something where we can see if we're actually changing the architecture of the muscle without having to take a muscle biopsy uh, or anything kind of invasive like that to conclude on this then right it's very pleasing to see that hamstring nordic curls are things that work uh, they'll actually make a difference not only to the strength output, so we see the differences in like eccentric strength after just a short intervention, but it also makes a difference to the actual architecture of the muscle tissue. If you like these videos, please go and click the link below. You'll find loads of other videos every Monday. We have videos just like this on paper reviews, and you can see the rest of our content there. If you want some longer form discussions, you can go check out our podcast. It's on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all the usual places you'd listen. Thanks very much for watching. Uh, we'll be back soon.